Family, uh, again, you know, we can come and gather in, in Jesus' name, and there is a lot to whine about. You can whine about the latest fire in California or the latest fire up north of here. You can whine about our political position or whether we're in a recession or not. You can whine about a lot of things. But understand, when you're here in this room right now, we're going to be thankful to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen. and the discussion. And what I want you to understand as we gather together today, we're going to look at a, a, a piece of Scripture that's rather unusual. But you will not appreciate the Scripture in its uniqueness unless you're reminded this morning that everything about being in here, everything about the authority of the Bible itself, comes back to a walk with Jesus Christ. Everything we've studied, you can go through bad times. Psalms 42 and 46. You can go through bad times, but if you don't trust Jesus Christ, you will not make it through. You can come and you can say, you know, I want my sins forgiven. I want my skeleton closet cleaned out. It's ugly. But you cannot find a satisfying forgiveness without Jesus Christ as the very center focus of your life. And so, family, we present the importance of Jesus Christ. We want everyone to understand that He died on the cross for our sins. And in dying on the cross, He paid the penalty. He satisfied God so that we would never have to face His wrath. And we were given the opportunity to know the love of God the Father through the love of Jesus Christ and of the offer of salvation by believing that Jesus Christ paid the price, did the heavy lifting, and asked us to believe with confidence in that and then turn our lives over in absolute confidence to what He's done so that He's our boss. He's our authority and He's the one we trust. And family, with that confidence in mind, we, we go through some tough things in life. And today we're, we're going through a psalm. And, and, and those of you who may not have a strong grasp on Scripture this morning, the Bible's got a number of places where it changes its, its cadence. It's not a history book. And where we're at this morning is poetry. And, and I'm not one who enjoys poetry but I want you to see the incredible confidence that, that David would have with God to fix his problems. And I want to tell you this morning, I don't know that there's anything worse than we can go through in life than be betrayed by a close friend. David's going to write to us in Psalms 55 this, the hurt that's caused by betrayal. Family, enemies can't hurt us like a close friend. When a spouse comes up and confesses that they've just committed adultery and your heart is worn out with pain. When your kids come in and having raised them to know and love and follow the Savior, they look and tell you, I don't believe that. And they live a life as almost as if they're out to remind you of what they don't believe any longer. When a friend who you've trusted in and you've had a secret shared to them in intimacy goes out and begins to share that with the rest of the world, you're broken. Family, more and more we're seeing church leaders come in and hurt us as they've misappropriated the church offering. They disappoint us when, when they are guilty of affairs or when they mistreat the church family. There's, there's nothing worse than a, a betrayal. And so David now takes us into that. 
And, and I'm going to be fair with you today. We don't know really, really why David writes this. We don't know of any gross betrayal in his life. But certainly, there were a number of points that we could point at where he's concerned. And so we want you to see this morning how, how a betrayal can be dealt with. How, how it can be laid before the Lord. And what you're going to notice today is if you've been with us for all of the times in which we've spoke, so far in every one of the Psalms, it started with God. My soul pants for you, Psalms 42 says. I want you. I'm like, I am so thirsty for a relationship with you. I want you more than water. And again, any of you who went to the work day yesterday, you know how badly you needed water. Any of you who were out in 100 and whatever this week, you needed water. The psalmist says, man, I want, I want God like a glass of water on a hot day. He comes in, he says, you're my refuge and my strength. You're, you're with me in Psalm 46. You're with me. And he does two things. Number one, he's the refuge. And it's that, that surprise of his, his care for you. you. You wake up in that oncoming traffic, having fallen asleep at the wheel, just in enough time to pull over. And you go, how did that happen? How did I know to wake up? Because you have a good God. He's your refuge. Sometimes he's your, he's your strength. You're going through something. Cancer. He's your strength to daily get up and have confidence that he's going to be with you. Financial ruin. You get up and you trust that that God's going to take care of you. Sometimes he's the refuge and keeps you from trouble. Sometimes he is the strength to allow you to go through it. Sometimes you want your skeleton closet cleaned out, and the first thing you want to do is run to him. Please forgive me. Today we're going to see the hurt so impact us that David's first action is not to go to God, but to be to real in the struggles. So if you will, come to, to, to Psalm 55. We're going to read it in its individual parts. It's lengthy enough that I don't want us to lose the connection to each and every individual section. So if you will, we're going to read Psalms 55 verses 1 through 5. You may follow in your Bible, uh, on your cell phone translation, or you may come and follow here. We're going to look first at a heart that's broken. Notice what it says. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me, and I, will, and I am restless in my complaint, and I moan. Because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble on me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. Family, when we're betrayed, we are deeply broken. No matter how close we are to Christ, no matter how strongly we know God's Word, no matter how intimate or often our prayers are, the hurt seems to cripple. That hurt affects ourselves, our walk with God, and our life experiences. And I want you to see David, David lays out everything that's going on within his heart and mind. He says, hide not yourself. Now family, we've often joked, we've often presented the reality of going into that, that season of life where your prayers don't seem to go higher than the ceiling, and you feel empty. Well, I want you to understand. Let's, let's make it a little more graphic. I don't know of any time in my life 
where I am more undone than when I feel that God isn't hearing my prayers. When I walk into a room and speak my heart and feel emptiness. When, when I don't know which way to go, I don't understand. There is nothing that is more horrific to me than that sense of non-existence of Christ's closeness. David uses some strong language here. He says, don't hide from my plea for mercy. Answer me. And notice, if you will, I moan. Now, this word, moan, carries a lot of ideas. If you look at other translations, it says this, in one way it'll translate it moan, another make a noise, and another distraught, another distracted, another overwhelmed by trouble. It is inconsolable hurt. Family, how can I lay this, how can I lay this out and give you a picture? Walk with me. If you're of a certain age, and for the most part it's a man problem, all right? But they call it the daddy noise, all right? The daddy noise is simply this. When you bend over to tie your shoelace, <laughs> after your shoelace is tied, you stand back up. <laughs> all right? Not only are you doing a physical action, but it's coming with a sound, all right? I don't know how old you are when you started the daddy noise. I can assure you today that I am well into the daddy noise time of life. Moaning and grief are along that same line. There are times in your life where you can't talk. You hurt so bad in grief. Have you ever tried to console someone? who is crying so profoundly, so strongly, that it's almost as if everything physically is reduced to simply exhaling what's in her and inhaling a new breath. And they can't do anything more than sob, moan, cry, shed tears. They can't react to you. They can't move in a positive way. They can't do anything else. Everything seems to be focused on the acute nature of the hurt right now. That's David. So family, he comes and he says, I moan. There is no stronger words in the entire book of Psalms. And I want you to see the reaction to that. David doesn't want to fight. He wants to run. So notice, if you will, in the very next verse, we, we, we're going to look at feet that want to run. And so he says this, And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness, Selah. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Family, there's a difference between a younger person and an older person. I don't know when that occurs, but I want you to understand it will occur at all of us and it will occur at different ages. When you were young, you were ready to tackle absolutely anything. In my case, Kathy and I got married. We immediately came out west, middle of winter, Everything that we owned was put into the trunk of the car or into a 4 by 4 trailer that we hauled. The winter was so bad, there was a number of times that we would get into slippery conditions and the, the trailer would rock from one side hitting the bumper on this side to hitting the bumper on this side to hitting the bumper on this side and we just said, man, isn't this fun? Let's go. We got to the West Coast and we didn't have a nickel. We had six weeks of living and we thought, hey, we've got it all. 
We're going to get a job. God's going to take care. You are ready because you're young. And then you get older. And then experiences happen. People hurt you. And all of the sudden, everything changes. You're not ready to fight. You're ready to run. And family, that, that run is, is, is significant. Someone hurts you profoundly. What do you want to do? I just want to get out of here. I want to leave. Nowhere in all of the Bible does David say, I want to run, except here. All right? If you ever read the stories of David, you don't find a runner unless it's running toward the problem. He couldn't wait to tear Goliath up. He couldn't wait to destroy the enemies of Israel. He never ran away from trouble. Here, he is so hurt. I want to run. And family, every one of us who are, have passed that younger, don't know when that is, but every one of us have said, you know, I don't want to do that again. There, there, there's no way I'm going to sign up and be a leader. It's, it's too painful. There, there, there's no way I'm going to do that again. I just, I'd rather not be a part of it. I quit. I'm finished. And I believe that there's a sense in which David didn't care and I believe it's, it's, it's somewhat wistful. But you're in the same position. The world and life has bitten you one too many times. Your company keeps making you work with that very guy who drives you nuts. You keep working and going. You go through that second divorce when the first one nearly did you in. Family, sometimes God leaves us in the very problems that we're facing. Sometimes we're part of the problem. Sometimes God keeps us in to refine us. And yet at the same time, our heart's reaction, our heart's desire is to run. I want you to know, thirdly, eyes that are inaccurate. When we, when we see life... We don't, we don't see it accurately. And I want to describe to you, I have two mirrors in my home, one that I love and one that I hate. I love my hallway mirror. I am so tall and skinny in my hallway mirror. And I'm certain every one of you think that when I preach every Sunday. Who's that tall, skinny guy? Well, that's Pastor Pete. All right? Love that mirror. Then I go into my bedroom mirror. Who is that squatty fat kid? All right? Now, my problem is, is which one's accurate? Now, I'm sure every one of you know which one's accurate. All right? And in my heart of hearts, so do I. But I sure want this one to be accurate. <laughs> Isn't that life when we're going through a season that is hurtful and grievous and tough and depressing or anxious-filled, we look at the rest of life, and the rest of life is horrid. Notice what he says here in verses 9. Oh, I'm sorry. Notice here, yeah, verses 9 through 11. He says, destroy, O Lord. Divide their tongues. I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it, on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. In other words, when David looks at the town of Jerusalem, all he sees is a miserable group of people who aren't doing anything good except fighting with one another, cheating one another, and causing disruption. Now, family, I want you to understand, I'm pretty convinced in one sense David's got a distorted look of life. We're looking at this moment 
that we call the United Kingdom in Israel. And in Jerusalem specifically, this probably is the high water mark for the nation. God is alive in King David's ministry. The, the tabernacle has just been moved, or the Ark of the Covenant has just come into town. They're excited to see these things. They are as, as spiritually focused as we're going to find almost at any other time in their history. And so to, to think of the, the town as being filled with violence and destruction and fraud and mayhem just doesn't fit. If you want to find that, you, you look at other times in, in Israel's history, the very temple of Israel was divided up into different sections where God was worshipped, Baal was worshipped, the goddess Asherah was worshipped, and even the stars were worshipped, and the temple was turned into this, this pantheistic strip mall. So, David's not painting an accurate picture, and when we're hurt, that's often what we see. But I want you to all understand, there's a reason why David says that. And the reason is simply this. It's filled with people like you and me. It's filled with sinners who think often of themselves first, they want to do what they want, who want to get ahead. It's filled with sin. Now, family... How much different does the words of David here sound than you and I sound as we think about what we're presently experiencing in life? Life's terrible. The government's just miserable. We're not going through anything. Please for, don't forget one great thing. The world is filled with sinners and the world will never, ever be fixed by anything other than the revival of men and women as they surrender their hearts to the authority of Jesus Christ. We will always have a bad planet. We will always have a bad community. We will always struggle in a variety of things without the recognition that Jesus Christ is the only thing that will change the heart and the mind of any of us. And David in his brokenness is no different than any of us. He's lost sight of who ultimately is in control. But the good news is, is in this psalm, it begins to change, and we're going to see the strength of David's perseverance but he, he first states a soul that is shattered. If you will, follow along in verses 12 through 15. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent, insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a friend, my equal, my companion, my family friend, we used to make sweet counsel together. Within God's house we walked in the throng. Let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. Family, no one hurts us as much as a dear, dear, intimate friend. And I would suggest to you no one hurts you as much as someone who you think thinks just like you spiritually. So when that spouse sits and on, and on that moment and on that night looks down and says, I don't love you anymore, you're unraveled. When you hear a pastor confess whatever sin, and the church has been blessed, and they seem to be having an incredible moment in time, and he stands before you and says, I have, I have stolen. I've embezzled. You're broken and I'm broken. Nobody hurts us like those that are most spiritually intimate with us. 
So David could use an expression. He says, we walked in the throng. Now, for me, that's a fun moment because as pastor, you need to understand this is my high water mark for the whole week, both emotionally and spiritually. On one level, do you know how cool it is to be in front of you this morning? I don't know that, that you, really can, you really can understand what a privilege it is to be in a family. And so David is trying to describe what it's like to be in the throng. The Israelites back then only met a number of times together, and they always came to the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was, later the temple. And as they met together, they all brought their sacrifices. As they met together, it was a time of spiritual recovery. It was a time of celebration and worship. It was a time when there was a lot of laughter and, and, and joyful being and, and connection. And I want you to understand, if you will, if church can be a party, that was the, the, the sense, that was the privilege. And he says, I, I walked with you in those moments. I celebrated with you. As he sang loud, there his friend was, and all of a sudden, the friend has betrayed him. And his soul is shattered. And he just simply says, Lord, you need to take care of this. You need to fix this. This is laid upon you. Let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place. And he just simply asks God to judge Family, David is completely distressed. Our best friends often make our worst enemies. But I want you to notice, as we see recovery, I want you to notice a spirit that perseveres. In this long section, follow along, he says this, but I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battles that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. Who, or he who is enthroned from of old, Selah, because they do not change and do not fear God. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet words, or yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. You will never permit the righteous to be moved, but you, O oh God, will cast them down into the pit and destruction. Men of blood and treachery, shall not live out their days, or live out half their days, but I will trust you. So family, as we, we, we see how, how David finally comes to grips with what he's going through, I want you to notice the, the, the strong entity. He recognizes that God and God alone is his ultimate and intimate friend. And when you go through the experience or the friend that hurt you, please remember, first, take refuge in the friendship of God. When friends or family leave or fail you, know that He never will. He remains faithful, strong, caring, and close by. Family, the very words that David uses, the Lord will save me. He hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety. God will give ear and humble me, or humble them. David will cast his burden on the Lord. Family, David is relentless, persistent, and God's love for you is equally persistent.
His love for you is strong enough to overcome any love that has failed you. I want you to notice, secondly, take refuge in the friendship of the Lord. But in doing so, let God judge your betrayer. God wants us ultimately to surrender to his love. One of the, one of the great encouragement we have here at the church is when you come through the doors of our church, often you've had a ton of hurt. Somebody in the community has hurt you. Uh, another church has been less than receptive to your ideas or you as a person, and you feel the need to leave, and you come and you're hurt. And we simply look down and say, you know, when you come through those doors and you know Christ, our goal will be to provide a love and a loyalty to you that allows a healing. But part of that is also to declare amnesty. You and I have to recognize that ultimately the greatest healing that we will have is, is not to see some sort of justice done to the person who's hurt us, but to allow them to, forgive, to be forgiven between our ears, to recognize that God's in control and that by simply leaving it in the hands of God, the control of God and the care of God, that we find ultimately that we find ourselves back to where we should be in Christ. You will be locked in a prison of hurt when you cannot trust and leave it to God to work. Forgive and move on. Family, the, the very turning point of David is he gets confidence are, are these words, the Lord will save me. He hears my he hears my voice. He redeems my soul. Give ear, or God will give ear. Family, as you wait, as you wait for him to act, remember that Jesus Christ knows better than anyone what it means to be betrayed. If I take you to the very last night that Christ lived, can you imagine what it had been like when Judas came up hugged Jesus Christ and planted a kiss on his cheek as a sign that this, was, this is the guy I want you to arrest. This is the guy that I want, you to, I want you to take in. He's the one. Jesus' very words of returning is, my friend? My friend? Just a few hours later, the second of the disciples will utter three times, I don't know him. I don't know this guy. I don't want any part of his life. Who is he? I'm not one of his. And it seems to me that Jesus Christ left us with an incredible, specific design on how God takes care of assigning out how he handles judgment. To the one, Judas, he didn't seek surrender to God. He didn't seek restitution with Jesus. And he ran away into guilt-filled suicide. The other, Dave, or the other Peter would come and he'd seek forgiveness. And you and I know that moment of forgiveness. As Peter was asked by Jesus Christ, do you love me? Do you love me? Three times. And, and, and any of us who, who've read both the story of his betrayal and the story of Peter's restitution recognize that the threefold, the threefold I don't know him is matched by the threefold do you love me? And Jesus Christ, in his infinite wisdom and power, ability, not only restores Peter, but then sends him on to be the very early leader of the church. And family, we don't know how God's going to take care of and bring about the justice to the person that hurt you, but you leave it in the hands of that most high God. Recognize instead of staying crippled by the one who betrays you. Leave the moment 
the same way David did when he said simply this, I will trust in you. And so family, you and I don't know how the story's going to turn out. You and I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know, and I don't know what the person who hurt us or how we are going to react in the tomorrows. But our Lord does. And I want to encourage you to follow the same. That in the end of the, at the end of the story, at the end of the hurt, we will trust in Him. Father in heaven, dear God, I, I thank you for this, this variety of psalms that you bring to us in your book. Dear God, they, they allow us to see how in keeping a relationship with God on high, in, in, in maintaining that friendship, the hurts that we, we experience in life, betrayal, dear God, sins, skeleton closets that are filled with our past behaviors, dear God, times of... of of seemingly detached trial that we can't make it through. Ultimately, dear God, the only source that we have to allow us to come through with any level of sufficiency is the work of Jesus Christ. So, Father, I just ask you to watch over and allow us to, to express ourselves with an internal confidence that says, I will trust God. We pray your watch care in Jesus' name. Amen.